of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, roll call, Mrs. Mayor, if you would do the roll call, please. Absolutely. Anita Jagosinski. Here. Kate Mayer. I'm here. Tim <laughs> Maniker. Here. Colin Trivet. Here. Lisa Collins. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Joe Gittens. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Board norms reflection. I guess the, the note I would have is that the norms are now in your blue <coughs> folder as a reminder to you of meetings, um, norms <coughs> that we adopted a, about a month ago. And I would have you reflect on those and look at those. And as we proceed, um, just ask your participation in those. Um, so approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda was amended on 321. It was sent to the local media. Um, with that in mind, are there any additional changes to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? <clears throat> And again, noted that it was as published on March 21st. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Uh, uh, public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We'd ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone coming forward, so we will move on to district administrator's report. Just a couple additions to the written report, uh, some acknowledgments tonight in the personnel report. You'll uh, notice I wanna just highlight uh, Mrs. Norgard as far as submitting her resignation. We celebrate with her and thank her for her many years of service, I believe about 35. And I also want to, I think in the past personnel reports, we. For whatever reason, we have not uh, mentioned a couple other folks that have submitted their retirement notices. And so, um, and we'll continue to monitor that and, and bring so publicly we can recognize and celebrate them. But I, I did want to mention that also, um, high school teacher Gary Bergman um, had already appeared on a prior personnel report. And I believe we have 30 years uh, for him. And then also Donna Dummer, um, Evergreen, Longtime teacher, uh, 38 years. And so we, uh, again, uh, we'll have other op more opportunities to recognize them as well as other employees in the district that are, uh, uh, have made that difficult decision. But this is the time of year where, where we um, have some of those notices. So, um, and then I also wanted to note that, um, I know we had put out there, I recognized Mr. Nick Weber for um, being, uh, receiving the Friend of DECA Award, and uh, Mr. Bear and I had the great opportunity to make the drive down to Lake Geneva and, uh, last week. And so um, I tell you, it's, it, I've had the privilege of doing that a couple times over the years, and, and uh, we have quite, we're known throughout the state in the Midwest to have one of the top DECA programs around. And so credit to our staff for that, but I tell you our, our students, it's just uh, quite a thrill to be with them that evening. And um, uh, I can tell you they, you can rest assured and feel proud of, of the work that they do and, and the, their accomplishments. So um, I think that's it, unless there's questions. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move on to reports and discussion. Um, health insurance options, I see Mr. Clark at the table. I am here and Mr. Miller will be joining me and I'll go ahead and get started. Um, bring the PowerPoint slide up. Uh, we're gonna do two parts tonight. I will present information on uh, why do we need to consider changes to our health insurance plan. And the primary reason for that is affordability. Um, and what do we mean by affordability? Well, unless we're ready to make changes, 
potential changes in our health insurance plan, we could end up with uh, fewer and fewer employees being able to afford the health insurance plan because of the premium cost and the district having fewer and fewer dollars to meet student and staff needs because of the cost of health insurance. And what evidence do we have of that? Uh, first is to look at the claims ratio. And to look at the claims ratio in isolation, you have to ignore some other factors that uh, affect health insurance, such as medical inflation and the Affordable Care Act. If we take a moment to look at just the claims ratio history, uh, we'll see how premium rates in future benefit cycles will be affected. So what's a claims ratio? Well, it's cost play, paid pardon me, by the plan for health care for employees. So the medical bills that employees incur, what does the insurance plan pay in? And you divide that amount of money going out in claims by the amount of premiums paid into the health insurance plan. And the industry standard is you should have about an 85% ratio between these two numbers. The remaining 15% is used to process the claims, cover overhead of the companies, and provide the insurance companies with some degree of profitability. For every dollar in premiums paid then, about 85 cents goes to pay health insurance uh, claims cost. Um, claims ratio can be a surplus or a deficit. Ratios below 85% represent a surplus. That means that there's more dollars going in in premiums than there is going out in claims. And the opposite, uh, well, pardon me, a, a surplus would be justification to go to the insurance company and say you're charging us too much. We're paying more in than claims going out. Um, ratios above 85% represent a deficit and justify increases in premium rates. What's that mean to the school district of home? And some preliminary information we have says that claims for the 2013 calendar year, you can see $5 million of cost there and $1 million of cost for medical and prescription drug claims. So our claims were about $6 million. And during that same period of time, we paid in about $5.8 million in premiums. And you can see how many we had on single plan and family plan to come up with that total premium payment. That's a 105% claims ratio. That's a deficit. That's a justification for claims increases. How much would that justify as an increase? Um, remember, 85% is the standard. If our claims are at $6 million and you divide that by that 85% ratio, um, the premiums we would be paying at that 85% rate would be $7.1 million. Um, remember, we paid about $5.8 million. So we'd have to increase our premiums by $1.3 million just to achieve the 85% ratio. That's a 23% premium increase just to achieve the 85% standard. Um, remember, this ignores things like the Affordable Care Act uh, and its influence on claims uh, on the market. Um, the industry response is typically to the worst case scenario, and I think we described e earlier that uh, some organizations are looking at 50 and 60% increases just in adjusting to the Affordable Care Act. Um, we recently received some preliminary information that the La Crosse School District is looking at a 25%. So these collective thoughts grab our attention. Um, our budget is allowing for a 10% increase. You remember in the budget input variables. Uh, for the district's portion of the premium, uh, generally for employees, some are a little bit different, but the vast majority we pay 80% and the employee pays 20%. Uh, we pay $5.8 million in premiums, 80% the district share being $4.6 million, a 10% increase, and that's what we have in the budget, about $465,000. Uh, if the increase is 25%, as we illustrated based on claims, being 23%, lacrosse being 25%, the new budget gap we'd introduce is about $700,000. And so from a district perspective, if we want to be careful about where we can put money for programs and for staff, we need to be aware of the fact that we could have a $700,000 
budget gap that we need to address if we aren't prepared to do something with health insurance. From the employee's perspective, an employee who's on the district's family plan, the premium is $21,000 a year. The employee pays about 20% of that, or $4,360. A 10% increase, which we have budgeted, would mean their premium contribution would go up $436. What that means is an additional $436 will be deducted from their gross wages because that's what a premium contribution does. It reduces your take-home pay. If we have a 25% increase, the take-home pay reduction, that is their premium contribution, would go up $1,000. And I remind you that we've had wage increases a little bit above or a little bit below 2% a year. If you calculate that out, a person would have to make $50,000 a year for the 2% increase, they increase their wages by $1,000 for them just to break even. And the CPI index uh, is 1.46. So we're concerned about the employee's budget as well. And if we have a 25% increase, they'll take a reduction in net pay. So those are the points that we would make in terms of evidence on affordability of insurance for both the school district's budget and for the employee's budget. So for this reason, we need to be looking at options. And um, as you know, we've been doing that and developing some options for you to consider tonight, which we then in three subsequent meetings with employees would receive input. And I don't know, did you cover the meetings? I'll be covering that, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'll turn it over. Are there any questions about affordability and why we need to be ready to make some decisions if we are faced with a 23% increase? Okay, I'll let Mr. Miller. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark has described why we need to look at options uh, for the coming health uh, plan year. I'm going to be covering the development of plan, option, plan design options and uh, where we went from there. Uh, first of all, our objectives were to uh, obtain pricing options early and we're doing that so that we can provide adequate time to make the best decision so that we're not um, being surprised by a large increase and then having to hurry up and, and rush and, and make a lot of last minute decisions. We also want to achieve uh, input from staff and, uh, and the school board. On that topic, um, there are actually, um, because of the importance of this topic, this will be coming before the board actually four times. Tonight, another time for these uh, design options, and then twice after we receive the quotes, you'll be, you'll be seeing this, uh, this topic twice with an opportunity to give uh, review and input. We'll also be presenting this to the staff and give them three opportunities on these dates, March 26th and twice on April 1. And um, at each stage of this review and uh, meetings and, and input, we will modify our um, design as, uh, as necessary and as we get input. Uh, the agenda for those uh, staff review meetings um, include talking about why we're accepting pricing on health insurance options. A lot of what uh, Mr. Clark just went over will be explained to employees so they can understand why we're doing this. Uh, we'll talk about the renewal timeline. And also, uh, again, this ties right into what you just heard. They'll be hearing the same information. Um, you'll be hearing a little bit about uh, driving factors and what data that we found in our review. Uh, there was uh, three of us, uh, Mr. Clark, myself, and Janice Wavra from the Insurance Center we, um, we studied, uh, dug in deep with all of these um, dozens and dozens of pages of reports to, to try to get down to the bottom of, of what's driving these uh, claims uh, to the levels that they are. We would then um, talk about evaluation and selection of strategies, talk about implementation as to what years these, would, uh, these changes might take place, how to get in more information, and uh, also uh, questions and input. The um, employees will be given an opportunity to ask questions at the meeting. They can also uh, submit questions confidentially, email, 
written, whatever, whichever way they want to. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we needed to uh, identify and examine driving factors to really get to the bottom of uh, making good um, design option uh, recommendations. And uh, we also um, then listed, evaluated, and selected those potential options, determine the implementation year, and will ultimately incorporate this into a, a new three-year direction. These are the driving factors that we considered, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Utilization and claims was a, was a big item that we looked at. Wellness base, what does our wellness plan and what can our wellness um, initiatives do to help, help us uh, drive these claims down and, and really help make people healthier, which is the ultimate goal. Um, we looked at affordability of premiums and affordability of maximum out of pocket. Those are very important to, to everyone. Accessibility to a provider of choice, we also looked at that. Also the competitive market, we reviewed what other school districts are, um, how they're designing their plans, what their rates are, we compared ourselves to uh, businesses in the private sector of all, of all sizes so we could see how we compare. Um, as far as uh, listing, evaluating, <coughs> selecting potential options, we again base this on uh, actual data. We, um, I want to point out at this point that we, uh, the data that we looked at is all uh, based on uh, totals of uh, medical claim data by, by category, and there's no individual data that we've been provided. It's all, all confidential. And when Mr. Miller says individual data, we really do want to stay away uh, legally and for just ethical reasons from an individual person's claims experience or even small numbers of claims. It's really broad group information. So with that, we, we, get, we jump right into the uh, information. And I want to point out that um, in your packets and at, at the door there are copies of these. It's a three-page document that's... Um, that is titled Health Insurance Plan Options for Consideration. It's a landscape print with, with blue lines. You may want to refer to that. Because I'm only going to hit the, um, the design options. I'm not going to be um, mentioning every detail which you have in your report. But um, this starts out with, um, I've identified the driving factors there. We um, identified each of them with a, with a letter. And you'll see on the right that um, there were actually eight options that, we've, that we're bringing to you to, tonight. Um, the first option, uh, A, which is, uh, or I'm sorry, the driving factor, Affordable Care Act, we noted that um, none of our options uh, were affected by the Affordable Care Act because Home and Schools is already compliant with, with ACA, and therefore no changes were recommended to that. But you can see that um, most of the other options um, are affected or, or directly uh, apply to uh, a number of the other driving factors. So let's begin. Um, the first area is plan design options. The these are what you would see traditionally um, in plan reviews. And it has to do with looking at the levels of deductible coinsurance and maximum out of pocket. Uh, the first, we, we broke these into four categories, A, B, C, and D. They're all kind of interrelated, so they're all presented as one option. Um, a is to request quotes for year two and year three of the three-year direction. And um, just as a reminder of what that is, you may recognize this uh, report, which has been presented before. And you can see that a year ago, there was a three-year direction. Um, of which included a 14, 15, and a 15, 16 year. We would want to take advantage of that work that that committee has done and use that, those plan designs as an option for what we, uh, what we use. We would also consider a range of levels for deductible coinsurance and maximum out of pocket. At this, at this point, we don't know exactly what the rates are going to come in at, so by getting a range of, of levels, we'll, we'll be able to select levels that fit within our budget or fit within the goals that we're trying to achieve. The item C is to um, then look at the uh, how we uh, 
deal with um, claims that are out of network. As you may know, we get discounts for in-network. It's higher costing to the plan for out of network. So we would look at increasing that uh, cost for people choosing to go out that would encourage people to stay in network. And then item D has, is a, a popular choice. It's, uh, it's something that's been requested. Uh, and this kind of, I think, ties all of these together. And that is to provide dual choice, one with a higher benefit and one with a lower premium. By looking at the various options that come in through A, B, and C, we should be able to select um, what we would think of as the as sort of a, the base plan uh, that would be at a reasonable uh, cost level and then uh, allow people to buy up uh, to a higher benefit plan and then have the option of those two, of those two uh, scenarios. And we think that that's the best way to give people um, that really want to, they're willing to pay a little more premium for a higher benefit versus others that may um, really be looking at, at mostly the lower premium. If, can I ask a question yes. right now or should I wait till the end? Um, sure. That last point you were talking about to me is like a brand new option. Is that correct? Has that ever been offered before? within our school not, district? Uh, Kate, not here. Not uh, in the here, home and school yeah. district, we've had uh, basically, historically, we had different plans for different groups. But if you were an employee within that group, you really only had one option. Yes. And so this would be, this would be new for us. And that's something we could embrace, and it would be cost effective. I mean, obviously, or you wouldn't bring it forward. But we want to get more information to find out just to how find cost out effective. If that's true. Yeah, it, it would be. It certainly presents an option for employees, which we think uh, might be attractive uh, in its own <coughs> right. Um, but but certainly, we're trying to address affordability issues and um, employees having a choice of which provider they go to. In some organizations, if you want that choice of provider, then you have to buy up to a new plan that affords you that choice because to keep it affordable for some other employees in the district, you can't offer that kind of choice. So those are the types of um, ideas we'll be pursuing there. Right? Thank you. And, and is there I, any I'm, kind of a, a factor as far as the time, a, a time factor when people can buy in and buy out of this? Uh, typically, those are on an annual right. basis that Just they have to elect one the. One time only. Right. No, well, not. I don't know that it's one time only, and some of that will depend upon how we choose to design the plan. There are some that allow the uh, some districts and some employers allow the individual to elect to change plan, but it has to be on an annual basis or with certain amount of notification period, which may be 12 or 18 months. Um, there's lots of variability there, right. Ben. I, no, no, I, I, I was just going to agree with what you said. Typically, there's an annual open enrollment. And then once you're in that plan, you stay with that plan for the year. That's how it's typically. Yeah. The thing you can't do, Joe, is allow somebody to be on the cheaper plan until they get sick, and right. then they just want to change to That's the higher right. price plan. You can't allow that to happen. But if, if someone's spouse loses their job or something, then they suddenly have to go on insurance, is that window still open for them or that opportunity? That's or if you marry, do you have, sure. or if you have, yeah. Somebody who's simply not on the plan and they have a, what we refer to a qualifying event that occurs in their family. It could be a divorce that occurs and somebody loses coverage because of that. It could be some dramatic change in their employment or the plan at the other. Those types of events also afford opportunities. Okay. So much of that has to be outlined in the plan design, but those are the types of things we need to keep in mind. And I might mention uh, one uh, thing to watch for in dual choice is that uh, from what I understand is we don't want a scenario where it creates adverse selection. And uh, from what I understand is if the two plans are too far apart, you can, re you can get some adverse selection. So that we have to look at the relationship between the two. And, and we have good advisors that, that will help guide us on that what decision. What does adverse selection mean? I'm sorry. Adverse selection would be where the... Um, uh, the healthier people choose the least costing and the less healthier people are, are in the plan or you have people that are uh, not utilizing leave the plan and then all you have left are the 
the higher costing individuals, that would be adverse selection. It's not unlike what's happening here in the initial stages of the Affordable Care Act. That is, you, that's correct. Yeah, uh, and that can happen in an organization too. Um, to, and you need to be careful and attentive to that as you decide. So these are all new issues we need to consider if we're looking at dual choices. So then the next area that we, these, we had um, four areas of what we call high claim area options. And this is where we really dug into the data and tried to get to the bottom of what areas are, are driving up our claims. Um, this is also new to the district and, and it's something that in my past experience, I've, I've worked with quite a bit, so I've, um, I've seen it work very well. And that um, has to do with the fact that we looked at the data and we looked at the claims of three groups, employees, spouses, and dependents. We found that spouses' claims account for 143% of the costs relative to the number of spouses in the plan. That is 26% higher than the employee group and 85% higher than the dependent group. So under this uh, option, we would consider pricing of our plan choices to encourage spouses that have coverage elsewhere, such as through a, another employer, to opt out of the district's plan. It's, it's really a, considered a win-win. Uh, no one's hurt negatively, but we <coughs> per perhaps uh, protect our claims ratio by doing, making this change. So that is option two. The next option had to do with, we found that uh, in our research that uh, chiropractic claims were very high in our, in our district. The number of chiropractic visits in our group is 333% compared to the average in, in this area. That's 52% increase over the year before. By requiring a treatment plan, it would allow there to be a verification of medical necessity. And so that's uh, the, the third uh, option that we're, we're suggesting. Option four is to consider raising the specialty care copay. And there's a lot of data in your, in your large report, which I won't go into in, in great detail, but the recommendation came from our observations that showed that chronic conditions account for one third of total claim costs. The data in the handouts detail some current concerning trends. These conditions can be impacted by lifestyle changes, Raising the copay can encourage wellness behaviors and treatment with the primary care doctor rather than specialty care when appropriate. So that is option number four. And the way that would work is uh, the copay of a primary care physician is $25. What's commonly seen is that a specialty care copay would be raised to 50. And again, what that does is it encourages behavior. It also, uh, we're told, encourages there are some treatments um, that can be that the individual has an option. They could go to their primary care, and they, if when there's a choice or a cost difference, they'll choose the lesser costing uh, option. Option five is to uh, consider a plan design change related to family planning surgical procedures. This recommendation is to reduce the deductible, um, to remove the financial barrier from these procedures which could lower uh, maternity costs in the future. And there's some data in your uh, handouts related to that as well. Um, I also wanted to mention that these, um, I'm going to get into wellness, but before we get into that, um, the one, items one through five are all geared towards increasing consumerism and higher deductible plans are encouraged by the Affordable Care Act. They are encouraged because they encourage in consumerism Deductible and coinsurance plans have been around for over 30 years. Results from these plans show clearly that when people share in the cost of health care, they become better consumers. Some examples of consumerism include choosing carefully between urgent care, emergency room, or primary care for non-life-threatening conditions. Those that are good consumers use the free 24-hour nurse call service to make the most safe and cost-effective decisions. They take advantage of resources that provide uh, comparison pricing and lower cost alternatives. The next uh, two options deal with wellness and education. And although this is not really a plan design change, we can't really address the issues within a, a health plan without talking about wellness and education. Um, the chronic diseases you'll see in your handouts 
uh, represent one third of all claim cost. These chronic diseases include high blood pressure, obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. At the same time, <coughs> diet and exercise related topics are listed on the wellness survey as the first, third, and fourth highest request by employees. So employees are willing, they're, they're wanting information on this, they're wanting to improve, and so we feel that our wellness and education programs could tie right into that nicely. Um, we feel that diet and exercise education will impact five out of six of the district's chronic diseases. Uh, we feel that we can make a significant Im impact on the health of our employees with education and wellness initiatives. That leads to the last uh, option, which is, is the sta status quo option. And it's really um, presented just to make a kind of a stark contrast uh, between the other options. Uh, this option is to keep health insurance plan the same as last year. This option addresses none of the driving factors. It would mean that all of the costs that exceed uh, the 10% amount would be shifted to employees as higher premiums. It should be clear by now that making no changes to our plan would not be the best alternative. Our plan faces a likely deficit of 23%. Adding to that normal health cost inflation of 8 to 10%, means that our insurance premiums could increase by 33% this year. And with that, I will end with any questions. Questions? Um, I just have a question about um, number five, the, the uh, consider plan design change related to family planning yes. to address increasing maternity costs. So the plan design change suggested is, is lowering the deductible? Correct. Okay. Correct. Can I ask a question about that? One? I have a question too. What would that look like? I mean, your the design change to lower the costs having to do with the expenses of birth. What exactly would that look like? This would be. I, I wasn't trying to get into do much detail, but we're talking about um, family, fam planning, family planning surgical procedures. So, yeah. for making it discontinuing that, that ability to. For maternity, how can I? <laughs> yeah, describe so, it? I think so you delicately <laughs> described that. Um, the, the idea is that right now the um, co-pays and um, co-insurance may represent a financial barrier for some people wanting to make that decision. And as we examined the data, um, our plan had a relatively high cost for uh, maternity, and so it's a it's not meant to be a statement other than the. Meaningful evaluation of claims data and how we can maybe um, reduce costs by changing, modifying the benefits. So, if they chose a certain path that involved the allowance for that, then would that impact other reproductive care expenses, or is that just for those surgical things? This this option would not consider any changes to anything else. It's just that just that the, one okay. surgical procedure. Yes. This is in response to what data? The the data that you should um, it should be in your packet. Mm -hmm. yeah, but particularly number five is this because we're experiencing a higher than normal pregnancy claims? We had uh, in 2012 we had 15 members, 16 admits for a cost of $108,000. For 2013 it rose to 24 members, 27 admits. With for $250,000 <coughs> with a complication of pregnancy in addition to that of nearly $300,000. Does it seem ironic as a school district we'd be talking about a too high of a pregnancy claim ratio? Wouldn't we want more kids? That's another way of a, a profit center? I, I don't know. I, a revenue stream? Um, Just Saying. You can, if you want us to remove <laughs> that one. Uh, this is why we're here, getting input. I'm not oh. sure what I think of number <coughs> five. <coughs> we'll be five, it, number five, if you're actually asking for, for yeah. comments. Well, we, we will option. take you, your input as well as the input of employees. And uh, for multiple reasons, uh, this and others, people mm -hmm. might have an opinion. And um, I certainly are ready to, to hear those and include them in the decision. Um, one thing that comes to my mind is over the course of the past five years, we've lost a record number of experienced teachers. 
past pregnancy years, I'll just say it. Yeah. <laughs> and they have been replaced with, you know, with wonderful young teachers starting new families. And so I think there are possibly many reasons that we may see as we continue that see is that changeover. That's something to be considered. And so it's kind of a, I don't know, what I, I would be curious, I think, I kind of wonder, um, I like to think about all these things. I think these are wonderful things to be thinking about, and we do need to address them. But then, will we ever get to hear or see minutes from the meetings where um, staff are are having their input? Will, will we get that input as yeah. well as district input? This is like input? two years ago. We actually have a little form um, that we suggest they use. They don't need to use it at the meetings. Some are just okay vocalizing exactly what they think right there at the meeting, and yet we find many are a little bit timid about that, but they want the answer to their question. So they may submit it and ask us to read it anonymously, or they may say, don't, just get back to me. And uh, what we did two years ago when we made health insurance changes was we developed a Q&A and um, collected all those questions and answers, and that was uh, not just for the board, it was anybody who wanted to look at the information. And uh, that level of transparency, uh, we'd like to do this time too. Okay. You may never see this one again. If we do meetings with employees, this may, remember we're gonna get employee meeting right. input from them at three meetings, plus they can submit it at any time, and we'll come back to you with recommendations on options. Uh, Three, four, and five may be gone. I, and you may see a new seven, eight, and nine uh, as well. This is our starting point based on data. Please, I have a question just to kind of a opposite look at lowering costs. Um, has there been any look at the research that supports providing more cost-effective prenatal care to staff? that may, may actually prevent those emergency kinds of procedures, high cost, um, high risk pregnancies? I can get back to you uh, with more definitive on that. I wish Janice Wavra was here tonight. But my understanding is that all prenatal and wellness child care is 100% covered by the plan. I believe that's correct, yes. So that should not be an issue. Uh, we, should be, we should be out in front on that. And that wouldn't necessarily matter if it was a high cost part of the claim or not. That's just something you do. So. Other questions or comments? Um, just one more. Um, when I look at number six, um, chronic diseases, and I see heart disease, obesity, blood pressure, depression, asthma, diabetes. Um, one that jumps out at me is depression because that seems a little bit different just from my history and knowing what kids and adults suffer with in depression. Um, I know there are certain things that can be done, but in terms of depression too, and, and that's a big umbrella for lots of things underneath that, there, there are certain things people that are clinically depressed can do in their lifestyle, but there are many things that they can't. And so it's kind of curious to me that that's in there. Like, I have high blood pressure. I know I need to exercise. I know I need to do weight-bearing stuff for bones, and I do that kind of thing. Um, diabetes, diet, all of that stuff. But there are some areas in that field of depression where you can't change if you're schizophrenic. <laughs> and so I, that would be one thing I'd want to look at as, as families um, may have children who suffer from this. So that's that's one question I would like maybe for you to pursue and see why that's put in there as a chronic six. disease. Yeah, we aren't planning on any plan design changes based on that. That fell into that um, wellness and education. Uh, right. What can we do for employees to bring about personal wellness, right. including those types of And it might be in there do. because you want to encourage early diagnosis or getting help for depression um, for a child or self, either one. I'm not sure why that's there, but it does strike me as a little bit different than the others, which are uh, physical versus mental battles that people have, and that puts it in kind of a different category, or it could. Agreed. Okay, any other questions? Had a couple board members haven't asked, and I want to give you an opportunity to to ask, I did have a question about the driving <coughs> factors. Are they aligned with 
the interests that were raised by, uh, I was trying to find it from the old presentations, when you had that group that met last year. And were the driving factors aligned or are they aligned with um, what they had expressed as an interest by staff? And uh, particularly the affordability and accessibility, uh, D, E, and F, <coughs> those came through as very strong um, messages uh, uh, from that committee. Um, and so then when you take this information on I think this week, one day, and then April 1st. Yep. Um, will, you won't have, I think we saw that happen last year. We talked about these issues, and then when the rubber hit the road and the money, the financial impact of these things came out, we really hadn't had an opportunity then to go back to our employees and say, now look, these are the things you expressed a high interest in. This is what that's going to mean in real dollars. And I noticed that you're bringing it back to the board. Of course, we'll have to approve the plan, I think is what the, the last two meetings in May are. But is there going to be an opportunity for staff then once they see what the options are, what, the do, what that means in real dollars and cents, um, will they have an opportunity then maybe to provide some impact on and help to prioritize? Because I suspect a lot of these things are going to result in some savings. Some may not where we're increasing or eliminating a deductible in some of, you know, some of those. But for the most part, I think we're going to see some savings in these. But, um, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to take on all of these options and put into one new plan and this would be the option necessarily. But I would just encourage you maybe to think about that, having an opportunity to provide feed for our stakeholders to provide feedback once we know what those, what the financial impact's going to be. Um, point taken. Um, as I visited with um, negotiations representatives, um, from the various groups. They've reminded me of um, their success, well, failure, in reaching consensus whenever they dealt with insurance as an association. So I'd <clears throat> caution the board to think that there would ever be um, a common agreement on what changes should be made. There could be louder voices mm -hmm. and softer voices, um, but um, not as the districts made changes, but in the past as the association groups themselves have initiated changes. Um, change is difficult and uh, often, the current plan doesn't serve everybody perfectly and no change will as well. Uh, but we hope to get meaningful input during these first three meetings, um, reinforcing what they've told us in the past mm -hmm. or telling us they're in a little different place today <coughs> collectively. Um, but point taken, how, how, do we, how do we further get that um, ownership um, at that point? Yeah, because um, there is a difference. You said the word ownership. There is a difference between buy-in and ownership, and I think we yeah. really want them Well, to have that I, again, I would caution you that the union representatives themselves have said uh, getting uh, buy-in and or ownership on those decisions is, is quite challenging. Okay. Doesn't mean we don't try. Right. And I think that's the key. It doesn't mean we won't try. Yeah. At least to, they may, you know, there are bright minds out there. They may have better ideas about what to partner together in savings kind of thing. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. So that, I guess, that is it for the evening. Thank you very much. And this yeah, is. We'll plan on proceeding with these options, and that was our intent to have the board on board before um, we started going out and meeting with employee groups. Thank you. Then the WIAA Girls Hockey Cooperative <coughs> Agreement. I told Mr. Engler that I would be happy just to introduce this, and he is here if there's any questions. But this is one of a couple items that you have on your agenda this evening that we also are asking your consideration to be placed also on the consent agenda, even though it's just a one board meeting um, opportunity. This, uh, back in January, as you read the issue paper, you'll note that this had already come before you, but there were some other school districts that uh, since then entered in the conversation 
And uh, as a result, it would be our recommendation to um, accept that, uh, accept those, those new changes. And the, the challenge for us, though, is you, you had already done this, and now we still need to meet the April 1 deadline. So that's why we're here tonight. Mark is here if there's any specific questions. But this does fall on the consent agenda and asking for your consideration for approval. So if there are questions. Any questions? So it's just the addition of the other schools and elimination, I think, of one. My only thing is when they made it to state, we kept hearing about the On Alaska Hockey Program. And I know it's hard to push it, but um, I knew that we had some ownership in that, and as did other schools. And it would have, I think a couple of the stations would say the On Alaska Co op, but you didn't hear it very often. So um, we have had those conversations, <laughs> and uh, what more can be done? So, um, yeah. I know, and we don't always control yeah. that. So we need a new acronym with all the districts, right? If it was just, in some cases, if it's just two schools, that's one thing. But when you get a list, it's hard to uh, come up with a name, a long list uh, that represents that. But we've, we've had those conversations, and yeah. OK. So no other comments, so that will be on our consent agenda this evening. Um, then moving on to early childhood education assistant. This uh, is the second one where um, our administration has been closely monitoring this since really the start of the school year. And this is an area where enrollment changes even from day one. And so uh, what you have in front of you is, and it's um, asking for your consideration for even uh, if you're comfortable in approving this, it's on the consent agenda as well. But this would be adding a position, an educational system position in our uh, early childhood um, program. And so I know that Ms. Eitlin is here tonight, and also Ms. Savasky and Ms. Ms. Uh, Krakow, uh, they all have been involved in working through this, and Melissa Cates as well um, provided some input. So please know that there's been a lot of attention given to this over um, even months. And um, so with that, be happy to respond to questions. I know I realize, especially when we get to adding positions, to come to you in a one board meeting, that is not at all typically how we do things. And we are concerned about time. And that's why I emphasize this has been something that has continued to be monitored uh, closely and worked on. So, but I, we truly understand um, the position that we put you in as well when we're looking at uh, additional positions. So with that, again, several people are here to respond to questions if you have those. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Then seeing none, we will move on to employee handbook language re revisions. Melissa. Hello. Okay, so there are five items on the agenda tonight that we are bringing mm -hmm. forward for employee handbook revisions. These have all gone through administrative review, um, the employee relations team, personal and governance, perhaps came back and made some changes with those as well, um, and now to you. So. I'm going to focus on A and B. The last three items are, there's no um, language intended changes to how um, that language is interpreted. It is just clarification. So I'll save some time for us for the next technology update. <laughs> um, so the first item is the um, educational lane adjustment. This applies to the teaching staff. Um, the main change in this language is that we're um, expanding this greatly and adding more detail to it. Um, the language currently does not define the process that we use on how we process lane changes for our teaching staff. So um, we have gone through and done a complete revamp of explaining how that is done for all of our staff. Um, so that's the main piece to this change. Um, we also clarify in there that if someone moves to a master's degree, we zero out their credits. We've had some confusion with that recently. 
um, addressing if there's an error in the placement, what happens with that, and then how we will notify our teachers of this new language requirement. So um, we put a plan in place within this language to send an email out notifying the staff of the new uh, requirements within these the lane adjustment language. Um, and then the other piece that I just want to quickly review is the vacation accumulation. This is in, um, applicable to our hourly employees, all of our support staff positions. And it's really just extending the time frame that they have to use their carryover vacation, giving them an extra 30 days. Um, this allows them to use that vacation during the um, holiday break or the winter break that we have um, versus, so December 31st instead of December 1st. Just a little extra time to keep them, um, allow them to be in the buildings when kids are there and use their vacation when kids are not there. So um, any questions on these two or any of the other three in your packet? Any questions? I think the other ones were pretty straightforward too, so. All right, then I will be um, seeking approval at April 14th meeting. Thank, right, you. thank you very much. Then moving on to 9.5, District Technology Plan Update. Well, as uh, Jen and Wendy make their way up, I'll just introduce this. There was uh, interest in an update at this point, and specifically, you'll see uh, in your packet in their presentation um, how we're doing uh, specific to the allocation that was added a year ago, uh, focused in on technology and uh, really um, uh, um, pertaining specifically to classroom and uh, the impact and how we are helping to grow our technology, putting more in the hands of our teachers and students. And um, so with that, um, th thank you to Jan and Wendy for putting this together. And um, be sure uh, there'll be, there certainly will be opportunities for questions as they move through or at the end. Well, good evening. Thank you for inviting us to come back. Um, this first is just a overview of the slide. We've shared this information just <coughs> for you, and it is a review. Um, an additional allocation this year was made for $350,000, and it was specifically to get our digital transition program up and running. In addition, we also utilize the $80,000, which was the allocation for the instructional technology coordinator. You'll remember back in August we interviewed but did not find a candidate. So at this time we have been using that money to support professional development for our staff members that are part of the digital transition team. So as far as budget decisions, it's been a very collaborative process between principal representatives at each level, Jan and myself. And the main goals have been around implementation. So the first has been professional development program for the 81 educators that are part of the digital transition team. And this provides subs for them to attend trainings by innovative educators, which is Naomi Harm and the CISA tech director. The next is increased mobile devices for use by our digital educators, and that is more devices for students and to have in their hands. Also to provide a mobile device for our educators so that they can become digital natives like our students and be very familiar with using the different devices. We have also updated our computer labs. Our computer labs, as I'm sure you have heard from Jan in the past, were all donated computers by Gunderson, which are quite outdated. And especially with Smarter Balance, the new assessment coming up, that will be all taken on computer it's important that we have devices that do work. And then also the implementation of Google Apps for Education, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with Google. Google has many of the same types of 
programs that Microsoft has, but it has many other additional apps that you can add on to use specifically for in the classroom or with students. Hapara is is a, I'm going to say it's a dashboard that you can see what all of your students in each of your classes are working on. It's a way to share assignments back and forth with each other. And then also Gaggle, which is internet security and filter for our students. So, so far the budget breakdown. $83,000 has gone toward the 81 laptops for the devices for teachers that are part of the team. Then 21,300 is part of the staff development. The, this is, for the most part, expended. We have a few, a day left? A day. One day left. So it will be taken care of at that part. And then Google Apps for Education, that's the GAF certification process. And that will take place this summer with 15 educators. And this allows us to develop teacher leaders that can work with future educators within the digital transition process. And then the teachers that have been part of the digital team have also participated in the staff development during two full days. And $27,000 has gone for substitute coverage while they are out of their classrooms. So I'll just add a couple of comments to Wendy's slide. <clears throat> the 81 uh, HP full-size laptops, we decided to go with laptops for our educators because uh, we felt that an iPad or a Chromebook or um, other types of tablet devices just would not meet their needs. They, they have a lot of needs and different types of curriculum software that they use, not just Google Apps for Education. So um, we felt that it was best to select an, a full-size Windows 7 laptop. Uh, let's see, what else? We have additionally invested $92,805 into devices for the high school and the middle school. Right now they have three carts, charging carts of Chromebooks, 31 Chromebooks in each of those carts for their digital transition educators to check out, incorporate in the classroom, and they are actively being used. And when Wendy talked about Google Apps for Education, that is no small endeavor. That's a really, really critical part of what we're doing because it's with Google Apps that our students can collaborate with one another, our teachers can, through Hapara, which Wendy mentioned, uh, oversee and manage the files that students receive, interact with them. We're moving into a digital world we, where we want our educators to work with our students electronically rather than have them printing everything out um, and be able to give seamless feedback to the students. And this is a tool that allow them to do that seamlessly. So we're really excited about being able to roll that piece out. Um, over at the elementaries, we do have monies allocated and uh, we are investing in not iPads but learn pads. And that would be the device, oops, <laughs> I almost got hooked there, that looks, oh, I'm trying to get it on for a minute, that looks like this device. And it's a tablet, it's an Android based system. And what is very, very interesting about it is that our teachers can create their lessons out online in a cloud-based environment. They deploy the lesson through a uh, QR co code. The student holds up the device, points it at the QR code, and the lesson downloads via the wireless <coughs> to the tablet. The student's not able to just navigate around and open any website or any uh, application. They only can work with a very focused, instructionally focused activity. So uh, for the elementary, the educators are really excited about this. Uh, sometimes iPads can be rather challenging because, there, oops, sorry, there is no uh, way to lock them out at this point within our ability to support those resources, um, uh, keep them off of other applications and uh, changing settings and deleting out the background images or whatever it is that we've set up. So learn pads are the way we're going. Um, at 
our Sand Lake and Viking, we've already ordered their learn pads, Prairie View Evergreen, uh, Home and Public Preschool, and Sarah Wynn's uh, devices have not yet been ordered. So those will be discussed and will be ordered soon. The rest of the budget incorporates um, you know, the desktop computers for the labs, and we spent 115000 on those. And they are just our um, full-sized HP laptops, or I mean HP computers, desktop type computers. Hapara, as Wendy mentioned, cost about $16,589. And that's an annual expenditure, but one that I think will have a huge payback. Huge, because I think with a teacher dashboard, teachers will learn to use Google Apps um, much more quickly, and it'll be easier for them uh, to introduce it to the students. So we've already seen uh, 17,000 documents being created within one week in Google Apps. So if that gives you any uh, idea of kind of activity that's going on right now, there's about 1,059 end users in the system actively using it. Um, Gaggle, I think Wendy already mentioned that it's important that we are aware of uh, and um, monitoring student email for possible risks, um, inappropriate usage, let's say um, <coughs> possibly harassment type activity, and that's a tool that allows us to do that. Just so I throw up a couple pictures. This is one of the um, teacher training sessions on learning how to use Google Apps. And uh, this is the first use of Chromebooks in the high school. And so the kids were really uh, very happy to be having uh, that introduction. And for, I thought for many of the kids that they would already be comfortable with Google. They use Google uh, email, but they haven't all used Google Docs or presentations or other Google tools. And they hadn't seen the ability for 30 students to be in on one doc at a time. And they had a lot of fun with it. I think that, that I've watched probably 10, 15 classes uh, in the time that we were introducing it. And I, I was pretty surprised. I thought, well, it's probably pretty common for all of them to be using it and sh collaborating with each other in small groups. But it was something new, too, for them. And that's just a picture of, of the fourth grade Carolyn Green's class using the learn pads. So um, beyond that, any questions? Okay, so questions. Just I, I have a couple, but just my first one is, how many learn pads did you say you ordered, Jan, at um, Sand Lake? Uh, 31. 31 and then one for oh, teachers. The learn pads, we ordered 31 um, in a, a cart, a charging cart, and then one for each digital transition teacher. So 31 per school? 31 at this time per school, yep. So they, they share them amongst the 15 educators at that building. So it's a start. It's not enough. We all know that we'd love to have more. But we have to start somewhere, and they'll be sharing them to start with. And, and Mr. Oberweiser has interest in adding more. I know that with some of his funds or if we have more dollars, I'm sure they'd be excited to have more. Other questions? I'll start down there. Kate, did you? I was no? just wondering. Oh, oh. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just wondering about the. Um, Lisa, do you want to talk into the mic? I was wondering about the um, the eighty one thousand that was real allocated from the IT. It sounds like there was an initial need identified for an IT support specialist, and because of lack of qualified candidates or something along those lines, then it, it was decided it wasn't any, needed any longer and shifted over to something else or. Just, just, just for this year, we needed to start moving forward, so we contracted with Innovative Educators, which is Naomi Harms Group and CISA for so that we could move forward. The position is currently posted, and we're hoping by the end of the month, maybe we will come back with a candidate. With the, with the staff development, that money that was shifted to staff development and trying to teach you know the educators on how to use these tools the new um, what is the specific breakdown of that curriculum develop or that um, uh, in servicing and what does that look like it's a lot of money so I'm just curious what does that specifically 
like in so Naomi Harm uh, is probably uh, and I'm not uh, not sure if you know Naomi she is a very very renowned now nationally educator who lives in this area and I work with her at CESA for when I was a tech director there she does um, the training introducing our educators on Google Apps for Education she's also done the ISTE Nets standards for teachers training the SAMR training which is all about your perception of um, creating your lesson so that it's not simply using technology as a substitution but actually moving it up to very high level um, 21st century learning skill uses that are embedded into the instruction. So she has done that, that instruction. Kay works with us on the after school Tech Tuesdays where we don't, do not use um, subs at all. And, and teachers come in for two hours after school. We have about 10, 12 sessions. Uh, six probably have already taken place. And much of the work she does is a deeper uh, integration of Google Apps for Education, working with iPads, a variety of different technologies and focus. Uh, and she'll also do the mentoring for a Google, Google Apps for Education uh, certification teachers. So that's about 20 of their days. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, when the teachers go to those two-hour sessions, is that a volunteer thing on their part? Uh, no. <laughs> we, we have required three full days, actually, of training, two, where we provided subs. And then it, there would be a total of four two-hour sessions they're required to attend okay. after school. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Maybe this is a bigger question than... For <coughs> just to wrap my head around this so for years we've been looking at what we want to do to to play catch up basically in our district and I think we make some wonderful steps toward that I'm just curious as because we've approved all this money and the allocation and Jan what you do to help us figure out what we need you know I often use the phrases I'd like to rub the top of your head so your brain could just go into my brain and then when I work with my own devices I would be able to handle them much quicker well we're all learning together trust me <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. um, my question is is looking toward the next maybe two to three years out because I know that no one's budget meets what in, in this case, I think maybe even what our needs are in Holman, and I kind of look to you to set me up for next year, like, this is wonderful, everything that's happening here, but, but I know, like, when you ask the question, if we have one set of 31 things for a whole school to share, I still know we have places to go and people to meet. I think you're and gonna ask the same question I was going Okay, to ask so. so what isn't, what do you wish could happen right away, even though you know it might not? Um, wow, that's wide us. open. <laughs> it, it is really open. I know it's really big. I apologize for that. But maybe even categories that your teachers or your administrators and you as our leader know that we want to grasp next year. What's on, what's on deck, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to tackle it, or do you want to tackle it? I, we both can tackle it. <laughs> yes. Do you want me to? Go, go for it, and then I'll go for mine. So when we started this, we started it with a three-year plan with the hope that by the end of the third year, all of our educators will be through a similar type of staff development that the group of teachers are going through right now. And during that time, we will also continue to build our technology resources within the district. So, and I don't know if you want to say more about well, I think just in general, I think it's really, really critical that we take care of foundational pieces, which we have, you know, a lot of computers that need to be refreshed rather than provide teachers with eight-year-old computers that are breaking down. It's very frustrating for them, and I see that as a critical need. When you're a teacher, you don't have time for for issues that are occurring, you need to get logged in, you need to get to your attendance, you need to get to whatever you need. So I see that as one piece of the pie. We need to get ourselves on a refresh cycle for our equipment. Um, Dr. Carlson has already informed us that we'll have an extra 
um, allocation of money for next year, and that would be one of the top priorities. Our teachers need tools in the classroom. Um, they need to have their LCD projectors, their document cameras, their tools that make teaching with the internet and with technology be um, seamless and functional and refreshed on a scheduled basis. The teachers need support. You know, they need techni technicians who are there to help them where they won't have to wait for days to get tickets done. So there's, there's many of these things that we need. We're not unlike other districts in the sense that we all have needs and we all wish that things were perfect. Um, however, I do think we have some pretty, pretty important needs in comparison to, you know, where other districts, surrounding districts are at this point. We just need to keep working on that. And uh, teachers would tell you they want a working computer. You know, if they have a desktop and they're not part of this digital transition program and they have a seven or eight year old computer and it's breaking down a lot, they're frustrated. So I don't like to see that. It's just really hard on them and hard on break fix all the time. So that's something we really need to take care of. We need to support them in every way we can because they're working really hard. You know, they're working hard to do the main job that they have to do, which is instruction. And uh, we want the technology out of their way and not be in a roadblock for them. I have a question that, about, oh, sorry. Oh. That just helps me kind of, um, I really support that because um, as a teacher that, that was still involved in technology, um, there was such a huge difference in what I could offer my children if I had, let's, let's say anything, a smart board or Chromebooks versus the teacher who doesn't have that and has a computer that can't even access, that doesn't even have a projector, that doesn't have that. So we're talking not just about, we're talking about equal opportunity, I think, for our students. So I'm glad to hear that that was the first thing that you brought up. I would really support that. And then I also know the more devices we own in a district, the more staff we need <laughs> to deal with those devices. Um, so I, I like hearing that because, again, I'm coming from I want equal opportunity for my kids. But I also know that every new thing that we put on our teacher must be supported. And without the proper equipment, I can only pretend to understand what a teacher feels like if her next door neighbor or his next door neighbor has all this cool stuff going on. You know, and the kids are the kids are connecting in with the lesson and you're passing out worksheets because you don't have a device. So I I, I think, love to take, see can that. we move on yes. to okay. so Anita. Um, Jan, you mentioned extra allocation money for next year that you said how much is the extra allocation money? Can we we said it was a hundred thousand yeah, dollars. Can I say it? On, on the preliminary budget. <laughs> it was in the pre preliminary. I think it was right. one hundred. One hundred. Mm. Okay. Oh no, that's an accident. I think it was five hundred. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So I know, I know. And again, that's part of the preliminary. <laughs> I know. Which we know can change. Can I just clarify, is that additional to the 350? It is. Okay. As okay, when one, I think of the... one time. It, when you think about the 350 for next year, we do have expenses. Hapara keeps going. Gaggle keeps going. We've got an annual fee. So it's no longer 350 without, you know, without some pieces some some portion of that taken out already so so how how do you see our district what what do you see <coughs> our district to get to where we need to be technology wise how much do we need to bring us up to where we need to be and how do we get there and what would our timeline be and i realize you probably can't answer all this right now but i mean i feel like and, and I'm not putting this all on you, but I, I look around in the region and I look at other districts and I just feel like they, they, they have, they've advanced technologically um, and I feel like we're treading water and we have money in other areas and we somehow ought to be able to bring it back and put it in your hands because you are the expert. That's what we hire you to do. That's what we trust you to do give it to you and put it where it needs to be so that we can at least move forward a little bit and get toward where we need to go. So 
I do feel that you know what you've, what's been done is tremendous. I think we 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 have to always remind ourselves seven hundred fifty thousand for wireless was huge, and then another allocation was five fifty, and then the elementary that was huge. Now we're on to the real um, critical usage of that wireless with the devices coming. So that's big. Um, is it fast enough? No, it's probably not fast enough. But um, we are making great strides. The 100000 will help. Any dollars that can be allocated will help. We are ready. Our teachers are ready. They want devices. They want these tools. Many of them are very savvy already, have been all along, and just waiting. So the sooner the better is you know, from my perspective, would would be great because we're losing time. You know, when we wait and not update. Um, but I, I, Dr. Carlson has asked me to do an analysis that's very deep, and and projects to 2019, and I've done that, and I think he he looks towards the future too, uh, in terms of how do we address? I mean, how do you how do you handle this huge elephant cost? and get get plans in place. So I'll leave it to um, the board and, and all the powers that be to help us make that happen. So we have a good plan. I think we've made great strides. We're, we're seeing teachers already do wonderful things with Google Apps for Education. They are thrilled about Hapara. They're kind of chomping at the bit to get going. So yeah, so we're, we're I just, there's a lot of pieces that need to be in place. One of the things I just would like to um, follow up on something Anita said, and having been around as long as I have, I've seen the district when we did have resources and used resources, and I know that philosophically we believe in things like site-based management and those sorts of things, but as a district, I think it's important that we have staff who we empower um, to be the visionary for the district when it comes to technology. And for me, I saw that years ago previously. Um, it got kind of broken down where each building then was putting their own priorities. And I think what I'm saying is we're looking to you and to Dr. Carlson to be the to see the big picture for what we need to do as a district and to be the, um, when you talk about collaboration, to pull all of that input in and to, to get that feedback. But then because you have that expertise and you've been a classroom teacher, I was at West Allen when you were in the LMC and I know that you have that background to, um, to know what what's needed in the classroom, we need to go to classroom teachers first and foremost, but then there are differences in technology. You could buy 31 of a certain platform and in a year the battery will die and the screens will be breaking uh, much more than maybe more expensive units will. And you know, I'm just saying that we need to leave that decision making up to you and empower Jan to, to make those decisions based on that input that she receives and gets. But I just worry because that wasn't always the case um, with our technology and I think we saw that go in a wrong direction. And now I feel like we're going in the right direction where we're, we're kind of coordinating it. Um, but just wanted to publicly say that, that that's what I see as your role with the technology and the, the you know, when we hear about instructional technology, we know that Wendy needs to be part of that decision making and you do that side by side, but when we're talking about some of those other things, that that, that bottom line may be, may be different um, than what any of that input was that was received. And I think, the again, the experience that we have is uh, been so positive, the feedback I've received about those teachers, uh, um, the 81 teachers in, in this program has been very positive. As you said, they are just waiting to go. And so I worry that we haven't spent all the money yet because we're in the last quarter, almost the last quarter of the year, and let's get the money and, or let's get the tools in the classroom so that they can mm -hmm. be using them. So, so that's my little editorial. Um, said one other quick thing. Sure. Kind of summarizes a little bit to what you guys talked about already, but 
the technology and the um, staff development, I mean, it seems like it's a critical piece that works together and feedback from teachers, you know, they may say, well, you can give us all the computers in the world, but if we don't know how to implement it in the classroom by somebody who's done it with common core standards and also with the technology, it's not gonna be very helpful for us, it's frustrating. Right. And so that means, you know, to have somebody come in and provide a training and read an outline may not be most effective for our teachers because they want hands-on, they want, how do you do this, the, the intricacies of that, and we gotta have the right people doing those in services so that they're engaged and they really learn the skills they need to, to do the job right because they don't have a lot of resources to do it. So, I mean, that's where I'm hoping if there's staff development regarding IT and implementation of curriculum, then I hope we're really strongly considering like who we're doing the training. Who's doing the training? Are they skilled, experienced, able to engage, that kind of stuff. I would reinforce what they both have said, and I, um, the two people that we really have been instrumental so far are of the highest quality, so I think we are getting um, quite a bit out of that training, so, but, but absolutely, point well taken. And I just want to say to the board that um, when whoever asked Jan about um, how long is it going to take us to get there, and we we have a great interest to accelerate this as quickly as possible. And as I have shared with you uh, through our work, even going back, I think the board at the workshop the other night asked about the fiscal sustainability goal. And as you may or may not recall, the additional work to that, much of that is right specific to this issue. Um, I think I've come to you multiple times and said, if we want to really step this up, um, it's going to be very difficult to continue to do that through just a repurposing exercise in the district. So that is what we are working, Jan mentioned that analysis, that's we are, what we are working on that, that fiscal sustainability goal and trying to come up with, I guess I'll say at a dollar figure, uh, that we can go that beyond that the board will be comfortable with um, what would it take. So that is, <laughs> you're exactly right and uh, exactly hitting the point on what the interest is. Um, I, again, I would say to you that in the time that we want to do it, um, I, I question the capacity as far as being able to simply repurpose. So what would we do instead of repurposing? We need to go look at additional revenue, additional dollars. And that, so, could be a uh, referendum. But, yep. Would we do both? I mean, oh. there's always ways to look at something that maybe isn't as efficient as it could be with Absolutely. other areas. I mean, to rely on one or the other probably isn't reasonable. We will continue, absolutely, we will continue um, our process of prioritizing and repurposing and redirecting, absolutely. But I, I'm concerned that our capacity is not just uh, as far as depending on that solely in the time frame that we believe we want to do it. Okay, any other comments or questions? Nothing from the technology guy down there? Nope. <laughs> yeah. I'm just you. listening. <laughs> Okay. Can, we can head up the referendum. There you go. All right. Thank you very much, yeah. ladies. Much appreciated. Then moving on to the consent agenda items. We do have six items on the agenda this evening. Um, you can, if someone would like to pull any of them off, we can do so. Um, but we have board minutes, personnel report, financial claims and accounts, St. Paul's Lutheran Church Nutrition Services contract the golf or I'm sorry the girls hockey cooperative agreement and the early childhood assistant um, if you don't want to pull any of those off then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented so moved. is there a second a second discussion seeing none all of those in favor of approving the consent agenda <coughs> item as presented please signify by saying aye aye, aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then we'll move on to board member reports and discussion. 
Um, I will call on in, you in order of roll call for any reports and discussion. Anita Jagosinski. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, just thank the people who put the Renaissance dinner together on Saturday night. We had a really, really great turnout at Drugan's. Um, I was told by Aaron Foster, one of the coordinators of Renaissance, that uh, we had a turnout of like 188 people, I think. And I believe in the past, the highest number we had had before was around 120, maybe. I don't want to make Brenda Swoboda jealous if she's out there watching somewhere <laughs> in the audience, but um, it was a great time. It was just a packed house, and I can't wait to hear how much money they raised because I know last year they set a record in, in the amount they raised, but this year it was it was so much fun. So if, if you didn't go this year and you haven't been in the past, I'll hopefully be invited back to embarrass our table again next year and buy a ticket for me and you can um, join us. So we're going to try to plan it not during March Madness next year, though, because half of the <laughs> half of the diners were in Drugan's bar with the door shut watching the Badgers. <laughs> but anyhow, it was a lot of fun. So I would like to thank um, everybody who came to that dinner. Um, I would also like to put in a plug for the community center and encourage everybody who's eligible to vote to please go out and support the community center when you go to the polls on April 1st. Such a very, very important project that they're trying to um, pass in this community. Um, really needs your vote, so remember to get to the polls on <coughs> first. And um, also, I just wanted to say um, thank you to Barb Norgard. I see her retirement letter in our packet tonight, and I see on the personnel report her uh, retirement. She was my oldest daughter's teacher for a couple of years, and she holds a very, very special place in my heart. So, Mrs. Norgard, you will be very, very missed, and you're certainly loved. Um, and I'm sorry you're retiring, but I will never forget painting fish with you and making t-shirts at Evergreen Elementary and <laughs> seeing Laura Ingalls Wilder's cabin take place in your classroom with a river running across your ceiling and you are one of a kind and um, Holman was very very lucky to have you so thank you and that's all I have. Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, Kate. I I had notes of what I was going to say. Barb is on there. Donna Dummer. I want to add her to my daughter's head Donna. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about them too much longer because you know when I talk about people I love that I'm saying goodbye to, I cry, but ditto what you said, Anita. Um, additionally, on um, April 1st, uh, Town of Holland, as Anita mentioned, and the Town of Onalaska, you will have a referendum to vote on um, this possible community center. And those uh, of us who have been involved and people who are learning about it are so, so very excited. We believe it's going to be cost effective. Um, please consider voting yes for this wonderful opportunity. I think to shoot Holman into a whole, like Saturday Night Live used to say, whole oh, another level, or maybe it was Mad TV, <laughs> one of the two. But we need something like this, and th this is big. This is big. Um, also, school board election on April 1st. I urge everyone that's watching to actively support um, that election. Um, it's an off-year election and sometimes people don't show up personally. I think school board is one of the most proactive votes you can make. It causes change in your community. So vote, vote, vote on April Fool's Day. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Menninger. Nothing to add tonight. Mr. Trivet. I just also wanted to talk about the uh, Renaissance dinner. Um, being part of it and working it it was a huge turnout. I've worked it the past three years and it was just awesome to see how many community members and different uh, people from the school board and administration show up. I don't have the specific number, but I know we raised the most money we ever have and that money will be going towards incentives to use for student achievement and recognizing students in their fields at school. So that is all I had tonight. Thank you. Um, Lisa Collins. Um, I just wanna mention the I really enjoyed the Matthew Fail workshop that our board went through um, just recently, and we're looking at how to evaluate ourselves, which is great. And one of the things that I've come to realize out of that is that there's a lot I don't know about what goes on in the district as far as, you know, what are we implementing for new curriculum? What are, you know, we have to implement two new, two new aspects or philosophies, and what are they, you know? Um, the Lucy Calkins, don't know what that is, but heard about it, want to find out more about it. The, is it do it math? Or what's the, what's the math expressions? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hopeful that we can, as a board, kind of learn more about those new 
um, cur curriculum uh, processes that are happening in our district and find out what the teachers are having to do and what the kids are having to learn. So just opening up learning with that. I like, I like those workshops that we do, so. Great, thank you. Mr. Dunlap. I'd like to wish everyone a happy spring, even though it doesn't look like an outside. <laughs> uh, encourage everyone to get out and vote on April 1st. And uh, I'd also like to thank Barb Norgard for all the years. Uh, like all the other families in the district, she's certainly touched mine uh, and my children. So that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gittens. No comment. Thank you. Um, and I did have a couple things. Um, <clears throat> in addition, since we met last, we had the candidate forum. And Mr. Gitten, Ms. Mr. Gittens, Mr. Dunlap, I want to thank you for participating. Um, Mr. Cruz as well. I, he may be watching. Um, thank you for participating. It's always hard to put yourself out there and those questions come, you have a minute and you, I know we all just say, gosh, I wish I would have said that or I wish I would have, you know, made that point or whatever. But I think the district is blessed to have the candidates that it does. And um, I'm hoping that, as Kate mentioned, that everybody gets out and votes on April 1st. Um, I like to think of it as my grandmother's birthday, not um, April Fool's Day, but, um, and I know the community center too is a, is a key election um, and vote on that day, so I hope people are supportive of that. Barb Norgard was my son's teacher as well, so she's touched a lot of lives, I, I know. Um, and the, um, the Renaissance program, I was there too. I have an incriminating picture, a couple of them, of <laughs> Dr. Carlson trying to eat a cookie off his forehead that <laughs> maybe, Jan, we can get that on the front yeah, page yeah, of yeah. the web page. <laughs> so, but um, it was such a nice um, event, and I've been there the last few years and saw some different faces from the community, I think, since it was on the weekend, and that was very um, nice to see some of those key community uh, people there, but also saw some familiar faces, people that have been there. We still didn't make administration sing. We were going to, you know, try to do it, but they had that minute to win it kind of thing. And, and so that was with a, a, a tennis racket and the cookie and, you know, things like that going on. It was quite the, the thing to see. So it was a good event. And I'm glad, Colin, that they raised a good number of money because um, it is something that is very um, positive for the school district. So that's all that I have. I would note that um, we received the correspondence file that went through. Committee reports you've received are personnel and governance and student achievement and learning. Um, committee notes, sh you should have received those. And then the upcoming schedule. Um, we have the CESA School Board Outreach and Development on Thursday. I don't know, is it past the deadline, Christina, to let no, you know? So if you are interested in attending, please let Christina know. The April 14th is our board meeting. April 22nd is the new board member orientation. April 28th, board meeting, and May 12th, board meeting. And at this time, any reflections on the board meeting, how it went with our norms? I guess as the facilitator, we had a couple issues that came up that people wanted to have multiple opportunities to speak. And for those who don't wish to speak, I'm trying to figure out body language or something. Maybe you can give me a look if I look down that way or that way and let me know that you're not interested because I, I want to make sure that if you are interested in saying something that you have that opportunity to, to speak up. So. Um, that would be my only thing. Anything else from the group regarding the norms? Then we would um, entertain a motion to go into executive session. Uh, Mrs. Mayor, if you would read that motion. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of reviewing the district administrator's performance evaluation. Is there a second? Second. Okay, if you do the roll call, please. Anita Jagosinski. Yes. Kate Mary, yes. Tim Menninger. Yes. Lisa Collins. Yes. Gary Dunlap. Yes. Joe Gittens. Yes. Cheryl Hancock. Yes. And we'll take a few minutes to clear the room and come back into closed session. <laughs> 